the crowns of Kemet harbour a little discussed secret. This secret perfectly explains why Egyptologists have been unsuccessful in recovering any of the many lost crowns of Kemet, in spite of over 200 years of excavations across Egypt. In this video, we explore the possibility that the most famous crowns of ancient Egypt were not crowns at all, at least not in the traditional solid metallic state we have become accustomed to in European monarchies, but rather the crowns of Kemet such as the Hejet, the Atef, the Nemes and the Deshred were all simply felt, linen or beaded wraps that decorated but conformed to the shape of culturally significant African hairstyles. Take for instance this elaborate bronze bust of the Queen of Benin. Confronted with this artwork, one would be forgiven for believing the crown to be, in life, a luxurious solid gold adornment similar to that of the Crown of England. However, in reality, it's simply a monotone representation of an elaborate coiffure constructed from beads and natural African hair that provides structure and support, making such a style possible. These trichological crowns, popular throughout Africa, seem to form the basis for Kemetic monarchies. For instance, King Tutankhamun was exhumed with a diadem and blue skull cap crown on his head. Why was this crown overlooked or not considered the true example of a crown? Was the issue that the Europeans who exhumed them were expecting what they had interpreted to be solid metal crowns shown in Kemetic statues and artwork, lacking the understanding of African ethno-trichological cultural practices, King Tutankhamun's blue skull cap crown actually perfectly adheres to the protocols of crowns in Kemet. Historically speaking, African rulers have always had crowns that accentuate their characteristically buoyant and upright hair, utilizing beads and ore fabrics to complete the look. As such, the crowns always conforms to the shape of the coiffure. An example of this domestically African ethno-trichology can be found amongst the Kenya rwandan speaking ethnicities in Rwanda and Burundi, who once practiced intricate and unique hair-shaping techniques reflected in a cultural tradition called Amasunzu. The Rwandan culture of Amasunzu is believed to have shared a cultural conduit to pharaonic kingship. The German colonizers of the region believed the Tutsi to be descendants of the pharaohs. In the 1931 documentary The Congo I Knew, Dennis states that the Tutsis had, quote, descended from Egypt, end quote. Whether this was true or just a belief fueled by phrenology is unclear. But what is evident is the Rwandan hierarchy of aristocracy and divine kingship formally reflected in the unique styles of Amasunzu unquestionably reflects the class and aristocratic layers that were once seen in Kemetic society. European colonizers were quick to identify the cultural significance of ethnotrichology, so they denied the colonized masses the right to exercise the hairstyles that bore so much social and historical significance. Using Christianity as a means of propaganda to demonize and excessively punish indigenous expressions of culture and social organization both domestically and in the African diaspora, as explained here by a native Rwandan. Koko bigi shukua kujira ni babi gira koko ni bigi isiyo siro gosh kandi koko shanu murimbo sasa kujira ngono naho bogo she kupio abonya hazi ni bogo she kupia gaka kondo bia ba. In his 2008 study, Jeffrey Tazzy acknowledges the importance of Egyptian hair in the portrayal of social and class status, stating, "Hairstyles were used as a means of displaying status." An institutionalized canon for hairstyles was established, coinciding with the creation of administrative institutions. These codified hairstyles continued to serve as the norms for identifying members of the administration or signs of authority. 
Tassi acknowledges six major styles used consistently for ethno-trichological distinction from the pre-dynastic to the Middle Kingdom. These styles are shaved, which is basically bald, cropped, which Africans identify as a shape-up, short round and curly, which is essentially an afro, the tiled style, which is short twists and the bob, which is slightly longer twists, are found commonly amongst the Afar tribe of Ethiopia. The shoulder length bob, which is long twists, can be found amongst the Maasai of Kenya. And finally, the tripartite style, which is full length twists or individual locks of thin to medium size, is a universal African trend. Other styles acknowledged are the globular, the swept back, the side plait, and the duplex buffant plaited, which are all basically variations of these aforementioned styles. The hairstyles used by the Kemetic infantry and villagers, which you will find in widespread use amongst the Oromo, this hairstyle is essentially a flat topped afro. So, as you can see, it is patently obvious that all hairstyles seen in ancient Egypt are only achievable naturally with curly African or Afro hair texture, hence the Eurocentric dependence on the unsubstantiated claim of widespread wig use. You will note a total inability to cite any remotely Asian, Eurasian or non-African hairstyles throughout dynastic Egypt. This fact remains a troublesome inconvenience for modern dissenters of the obvious African origin of Nile Valley civilization. Unfortunately, Tassi's 200-page report remains largely disjointed due to his general ignorance of modern African hairstyles. All in all, there seems to be little academic effort when it comes to relating modern African hairstyles to the crowns of kings and queens seen in Kemet. Let's take a closer look at the white crown of Upper Kemet called the Hejet. This crown conforms to a hairstyle adopted throughout Africa in various forms. In Benin, it can be seen in these upright bridal styles. Whereas in Rwanda, it is reflected in the style called Urugori, where the hair is pulled upright and rounded in a similar fashion. In addition to this, in southern and central Africa, the traditions of Lipombo and Isikolo practiced amongst the Mangbetu and Zulu, respectively, also demonstrate the cylindrical upright nature seen in the Hejet, but the style is achieved through the intricate braiding and weaving of African locks. The most strikingly similar example of the Hejet is found in pre-colonial Nigeria, this, or something close to it, is a likely candidate for the base of the hejet. In all of these styles, beads or fabric can easily be used to finish the look in the likeness of the Kemetic hejet. In the case of Kemet, the style would likely be covered in felt and secured with a diadem denoting kingship as supported by the words of Diodorus Siculus. He states when speaking of African and Kemetic shared cultures, their kings, who wear high felt hats which end in a knob at the top are circled by the serpents which they call asps, end quote. And as demonstrated, it would have been impossible to make this crown stand erect without the sturdy and malleable texture of African hair sitting beneath the fabric coating. Let's now look at one of the most prolific and certainly the most iconic headdresses in ancient Egypt. This headdress is the Nemes. However, what might be unknown is the intrinsic relationship this headdress shares with one of Africa's most popular hairstyles, a hairstyle universal amongst Africans globally that I had previously coined as the Kemetic short twist. The short twist, one of the most common hairstyles in Kemet, became almost a nationally adopted adornment amongst the middle class by the middle of the Old Kingdom and in other cultures across the diaspora they are referred to as starter locks since they provide the foundation for growing hair into longer locks. Egyptologists have had the historic trend of describing this particular style as headgear. Fortunately, it is finally being acknowledged that these are hairstyles, not helmets. Tassi states, the use of the word headgear is most inappropriate and implies that the deceased are wearing hats rather than wigs or their own styled hair that are actually being depicted. 
Although allegedly a wig, the mummy of my repri shows what the beginnings of this locking process looks like as it is taking shape. From the late period onwards, Roman artists, when depicting Egyptians, tended to show a more natural, organic nuance and variety of the style, as they observed it amongst the indigenous Kemetic population. Let's now take a closer look at the relationship between the twisted hair and the Nimes crown. However, in direct reference to the Nimes, we can see in this statue of Menkauri, the short twist being slightly exposed beneath the headdress. A massive clue to the length and volume of the twists can be seen in the back of the names that universally appears to cause it to bulge, much like traditional African hair caps at the back. This ignored detail is occurrent in every single depiction of the Nimes, as this bulge being indicative of dreadlock caps found throughout Africa and the diaspora. A unique feature of the Nimes was the way the fabric joined into a single lock knot at the base. These details coalesced beautifully to give the wearer of these illustrious crowns an appearance similar to the African cobra who was also present on the Uraeus. Could the Nemes perhaps be a lasting legacy of the first dynasty ruler Jet, who is also known as the Serpent King? Interestingly, Jet as a ruler predates the earliest depiction of a Nemes in Kemet. On the rare occasion that the twists were too long to be contained, the locks were encouraged to protrude beyond the edges of the Nemes, as famously demonstrated in this iconic statue of King Jose. It's important to note the Nimes was never created to flap around on a bald-headed king as demonstrated in Hollywood reproductions. These Hollywood representations are an invention of an uninformed and uncultured media. The striped decoration on the Nimes not only resembled the scaled breast of a cobra, but also seemingly followed the natural flow of the locked hair that would lay beneath. Locks being pulled back would flow from the hairline outwards and this trend of the pattern on the surface of the crowns, mirroring the style of the hair that lay beneath had continuity on many of the Kemetic crowns. As mentioned prior, the cap crowns of Kemet follow an almost identical usage as the Nimes, as seen in this statue of Tutankhamen. The cut, as it is formerly known, was a favourite of Hatshepsut, as well as Akhenaten and others in the Amarna lineage. The bag shape of the cut most likely provides a covering for loose as opposed to styled African hair in the form of an afro. Only the natural African hair form can provide the volume to fill such a cap, as seen in these contemporary examples. By comparison, Eurasian hair forms in any possible iteration do not provide the shape needed to support the crown's format. It is evident that the rear of the crown is filled with a substantial amount of hair. In contrast to this, the blue skull cap crown that the same king was buried with conformed instead to the shape of his skull. Whether his hair was cut bald prior to or after his death is unknown, however. Once again, following the ethno-trichological protocol we've established, the crown of the king conforms to the hair or lack of hair beneath it. This same style is one that had particular popularity amongst the Kushite rulers of the 25th dynasty such as Taharka who is depicted here. The Kushite kings seemed to prefer the simplicity of the short-haired crowns as opposed to the complexity of the lengthier ones. Perhaps even more interesting is the crown of Queen T, who once again wears the blue cap crown, although we only have traces of it remaining on this timeless bust. The crown in all aspects would have once been identical to the blue crown that Tut was buried in, in that it was made up entirely of intricately weaved blue beads, imitating the kinky texture of African hair. And, as always, it would have been finished with a diadem, however, the obvious difference being the volume of the crown adorning her thick and voluptuous afro hair. Judging by its shape, it most likely would have been a soft natural afro or indeed some kind of looping twists and threaded locks that lay beneath it. Thankfully and unsurprisingly, her husband, Amenhotep III on this famous stele, gives us a wonderful indication of what her hair may have looked like beneath the cover of the beaded crown. 
For centuries now, archaeologists have hoped in vain to unearth a physical example of the Kepresh, the military crown of war that suddenly came into use during the New Kingdom, following the Second Intermediary Period. Its uniquely sculpted appearance introduced a distinctively new format in Kemetic ethnotrichology. However, their hopes and attempts to envision a solid helmet-type version of this crown is unlikely to yield any results. Clues to the nature of this crown are given to us on statues, statuettes and steely art, which clearly depict fractal circular patterning throughout the surface of the crown. Bear in mind the established ethno-trichological protocol we've already discussed and it becomes obvious the nature of this crown once again lies in African hair traditions. In no other place do we see the elaborate hair shaping techniques necessary to create the unique Kepresh than in the Rwandan Amasunzu clearly demonstrating almost identical shapes to the famed war crown. Additionally, the same principles of trichological hierarchy and divine kingship are found amongst the Tutsi. The Tutsi even claim a direct lineage to 19th dynasty rulers that have been preserved in their oral tradition. All of this makes it clear that like the crowns already discussed, the Kipresh was most likely an Amasunzu style, adorned with a diadem and a patterned fabric portraying the African hair beneath it. Finally, we have the Deshret and other iterations of flat-topped crowns. Fortunately, we don't have to imagine what these crowns may have looked like contemporaneously since we have such striking living examples being used on the African continent. It was not unusual for men along the Nile Valley to cut their Afro hair into stylized modified shapes. This practice has been maintained by the Oromo who continue to tailor the shapes of their Afros in a culturally significant manner. Complementary to this trend, it is believed by some that the modern tradition of the flat top was a cultural inheritance of Rwandan Amasunzu. Could the flat top crown be a heritage of shared origin? It is generally unclear whether coiled locks, braiding or hair shaping was used to support the deshret. In the Congo, the Mangbetu culture create living reproductions of unique and intricate weaved hair into flat topped styles whereas the Zulu to this day create Isikolo hats that uncannily mirror the crown of Lower Kemet. In an almost perfect representation of cultural continuity, one can find these 19th century red Isikolo hats of which it is recorded. This form of the Isikolo developed out of a 19th century conical hairstyle that was worn as a sign of respect to one's husband and his family. In the early 20th century, a removable hat like this one replaced the hairstyle. This hat, with its flaring, disc-like shape, is constructed of human hair. The reddish hue is the result of the application of a red ochre and fat mixture colorant. Another striking example of the deshret can be found in this intricate hair-shaping technique found amongst the Jima of Ethiopia. They, similar to the Mangbetu, also possess the hollow center seen in the deshret once again. It's easy to see how this style could be adorned with fabric and beads to create the famed crown of Lower Egypt, so often donned by rulers of the unified lands. A massive observable indication of crowns as an ethno-trichological phenomenon in Kemet is the shared continental culture of African headrests. Across the many cultures in Africa that adopt ethno-trichology as a common practice, the shared utility of African headrests can also be found. In fact, it becomes a necessity as a means to preserve these complicated styles. The African headrest can be found all over continental Africa and this particular design, often but not exclusively a wooden head and neck support, hewn to form a curved rest and a base, is one that was shared by the ancient Egyptians, likely for the same purpose they have preserved to this day. Head and neck rests can be found among the Oromo, Guragai, Jima, Somali, Swahili, Shona, Luba, Mufinu, Chokwe, Kagaru, Songye, Yaka, Dinka, Turkana, Luana and Pokot, to name but a few ethnicities that practice this African tradition. It is stated by EgyptMuseum.com 
Although it may seem uncomfortable, headrests are still widespread in some African cultures. The design is not the only feature that is shared, since they all share the same primary purpose, that is, to preserve the painstakingly crafted coiffures of the owners. These pieces play an intrinsic role amongst royalty and aristocracy, often linked to ancestry and hierarchy, preserved and passed down as heirlooms. This now provides ample context as to why King Tutankhamun was buried with a vast amount of headrests. Not only would they have been used to preserve his complex trichological crown styles, but he may have inherited one or more as heirlooms. King Tutankhamun's wooden and ivory headrests pictured here were most likely utilized when his hair was in a complex style like that of the Kepresh. Logically speaking, as the king, if the crowns were not a trichological phenomenon, he would have no reason to have one, let alone a dozen headrests. Jan Summers even discloses details of a miniature headrest placed beneath the head of the mummy of Tutankhamun, likely used to keep his cap crown propped up within his golden mask. Although headrests are also adopted in the Far East and in Polynesia, within cultures that also practice forms of ethnotrichology, when referring to the vicinity of Europe, the Near East and Africa, ethnotrichological headrests are only found within the African continent amongst continental African ethnicities. So why is this important? Well, if an understanding of Amasunzu and continental African hair shaping traditions are properly researched and applied, then many of the mysteries relating to ancient Egypt begin to look, well, not so mysterious. Take for instance the beautiful children of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. For decades the conversation about their peculiar head shapes has sparked speculation regarding the nature of their origin. Were we witnessing the hallmarks of African cranial deformation techniques? Or evidence of an alien race? Perhaps surprisingly I would argue quite possibly neither. First, the head shaping principle in my view doesn't quite qualify because of the volume of the skulls depicted. In the available three-dimensional and two-dimensional art, the overall volume of the skulls seems too large to be a representation of cranial deformation, a practice that greatly affects the face and forehead. The overall lack of facial contortion doesn't quite reflect what we are presented with. So what do we have left? Well, if you'll allow me to ignore the asinine alien argument, a clue is given to us in the form of this cap crown worn by Nefertiti. Now evidently colourless due to time and erosion, this once would have been a vibrant representation of the queen in her likely blue crown. In fact, if we observe an alternative bas relief of the same queen, but this time not wearing the Urias diadem, you can see that her head looks no different in shape to how her children are depicted. And in the case of the children, since they did not rule and as such did not don the diadem, the only differentiating factor between where their forehead ends and hair begins would lie in the original colour of the artwork, which in most cases has been entirely lost. In my view, these styles are not head shapes, but reflections of African ethnotrichology like the aforementioned Urugori that contour and shape the hair to create a crown. The beloved late Queen Rosalie Gikanda, last Queen of Rwanda, here sports a beautifully crafted afro that bears an uncanny resemblance to the alleged head shapes of the Amarna royal lineage, in particular Tutankhamun's head of Nefertem, was this royal hairstyle what was actually being represented? Well, if this style is contextualized alongside the regional African trend of using red ochre and animal fats to coat and color the hair, such as seen in the Himba, Samburu and Hema tribes of Eastern Africa and also known to occur in ancient Egypt, then one can easily see how this could be mistaken for an elongated head when captured in stone portraiture. This single example proves why it is so important for African researchers to take the helm when it comes to research in ancient Kemet. The ability to link African cultural norms to practices in ancient Kemet will indeed provide the key to unlocking the hidden treasures of this ancient civilization. Thank you for joining me on The King's Monologue. 
a place where we are undeterred in our pursuit for historical truth by challenging centuries of Eurocentric ideology that has falsified the global worldview. Thanks to my entire Patreon family, with special thanks to my production team. With the generosity of my community, I'm able to produce these research documentaries with greater frequency, so do consider supporting me on Patreon or by purchasing merchandise. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and browse the channel to enjoy more of my research. Comment to let me know what you think of this documentary.